Welcome to the Imaginative Storm podcast. I'm your host, James Nave. We have a series of writers that we would like to present to you. This show was aired first on WPVM-FM out of Asheville, North Carolina, and now we're airing it for you on YouTube. My guest today is Greg Pallast. Greg is a journalist, a poet, a performer, an investigator. He has lots of interesting, powerful stories to tell. He blends his writing life with his professional life, and I've always enjoyed knowing Greg Pallast, and I hope you will enjoy getting to know him a bit too on this show. Before we get to the conversation with Greg, if you would ever like to join me and my creative collaborator, Allegra Houston, for our regular Saturday morning Imaginative Storm Writing Prompt of the Week session, we'd love to have you. 10 a.m. Mountain Time, noon Eastern Time. It lasts for an hour. We gather with a group of writers, and we write for 10 minutes, and then we read our work and share our work. It's pretty straightforward. Lots of laughter, lots of smiles, and you know, lots of lots of interesting, compelling work. Imaginativestorm.com if you'd like to know more about that. And if you'd like to reach out to me, Nave at jamesnave.com. Nave is spelled N-A-V-E. Now, please turn your attention to Greg Pallast. I begin this show with a comment or two about the many hats Greg wears, and we go from there. So here you go, Greg Pallast. And Greg wears a number of hats. He's a, he's a writer. He's a journalist, he reports the news, and he's a poet. So tell us what you've been up to. The last time that we spoke, you had just finished writing another book, and you have always been doing investigative journalism, and mm-hmm. that's, I, I would suppose we could say it's your day job, and then yeah. your your full-time job is being a poet, because when one becomes a poet, that takes up 24 hours a day, no matter what you're up to. So yes, tell us yeah. a bit about what's what's up, and how you've been doing, and what kind of work you've been working on, and and then let's skedaddle right to some poetic conversation. How does that sound? Okay, I'm sure Aristotle will be happy. For those of you who uh, don't know Greg Pallast, or maybe you do, yeah, that's the guy that you see on like programs like Democracy Now. And I was a BBC television investigative reporter in the Guardian newspapers, Rolling Stone at these papers, Rolling Stone, etc. Written a string of New York Times bestsellers. I have my very public side, which is investigative reporting and TV, et et cetera. And then my other side, versification. This is a good question. Is my poetry something else other than investigative reporting? I think of myself as an investigative poet. But I just returned from Georgia, where I found this woman, Pam Reardon, GOP official. She had challenged 32,000 voters, names like Kim and Garcia and Johnson. She challenged 32,000 voters, said that they didn't live in Georgia. This is under New Georgia law. And so I decided to go find the uh, voters who had left Georgia, these skanky illegal voters, of course, almost all voters of color. But there they were, her neighbors, (laughs) right down the street. Well, way down the street, I should say. She lived in what looked like a Gone with the Wind mansion. She was all dressed up in a red outfit like Nancy Reagan, high heels, because she thought I was interviewing her about running for vice chair of the Georgia Republican Party. I asked her about her challenges uh, to all these voters. Yes, she was going after the illegal voters. And I said, you said these people don't live in Georgia. Have you called them? No. I said, oh, written to them? No. Ever gone to their houses to see if they're still there? <laughs> they're still here? No. I said, well, I have. I called 800 of them. They're still in Georgia. They're right down the street from you. And I said, would you like to speak to one of the voters that you knocked off the voter rolls? Uh, he's on the phone right now. Now, the thing is, when I walked in, there was a shotgun next to the door. Ammo boxes loaded up on the table between us, several handguns. So when I confronted her, she starts swearing like a sailor. And her husband, who's in his 70s, ran out and grabbed me. But given the weaponry, I wasn't going to disagree with it. But this is the new game that's going on. She's one of a group of 88 Republican operatives who are going after voters of color. So this is the fun I have. This is the type of thing I do. And you won't see it on U.S. TV. That's why I report for BBC or Rolling Stone or or other places, because as Rachel Maddow said when she refused to run the the tape, it's to Greg Pallast, and that it is. So that's what I've been doing politically. So when you do this work and you go to Georgia and you're wandering around Atlanta and you're finding all these people and you're discovering what many of us 
we at least suspect, and then you prove it. You knock on the door and the people open the door and the voters who do not live in Georgia are indeed living there in Georgia. So when you're doing all this work and you're reporting on it, it what is it about poetry? Why, why is that important to you? Well, here's where I came from. I come from the anus of Los Angeles, literally. It's in Sun Valley, Pacoima. We have the sewage plant there. We have the garbage plant there. We had the coal-fired power plants, if you can imagine that. As an investigative reporter, I often say, I, I took the job because I want to find out the, the billionaire streets that did this to us. But before that, I needed an escape, a soul escape. And I was assigned to write about a poet called William Carlos Williams. Uh, had to do a book report like in the ninth grade because he'd won the Pulitzer Prize. So I had to write this report, but I actually never read his poetry. I couldn't find his poetry in the, in the, in the library, just books about him or writings about him. And finally, one night uh, I was in Palm Springs with a friend of mine who was 13 years old, and we had our own uh, room. His parents were trying to restore their marriage. That failed. But while they're trying to restore their marriage, unsuccessfully, we successfully snuck across the desert to a 24-hour bookstore where I actually found William Carlos Williams' poetry, and I was knocked out, and I immediately just started writing my own. It was my way the hell out of the sewage dump. Not because I had higher thoughts, but in fact, whatever. I mean, I could write about the sewage. I could write about, you know, you were free. He was a pediatrician, and one of the babies he delivered was uh, Allen Ginsberg. He, he was actually Allen Ginsberg, a pediatrician. Uh, that's how Ginsberg became a poet, because Williams nurtured his career and sent his stuff to Ezra Pound, who hated it, and told Williams, never send me crap like this again from Allen Ginsberg, but it inspired Ginsberg. <laughs> and, and so I started reading out this guy, Allen Ginsberg, and later um, I was a student of Allen Ginsberg. Here's this guy saying, I see the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness. And that's what I saw. I grew up in Loserville, and we we're meant to be losers. We were meant to go to Vietnam, and if we didn't get our legs shut off, come back and go work at the Chevy plant or the Lockheed building fighter jets. And my classmate, I was Pallas, sitting next to me, this guy named Paddock, Pallas and Paddock. And Steve Paddock is the most famous graduate of my high school. He's the guy who killed 56 people in Las Vegas and then shot himself. So he was my close acquaintance for a decade. He didn't find a way out. He was a genius. That's one of the problems. He, Steve Paddock, the Vegas shooter, was a genius. He was the one who fired into the big crowd of people at the concert. Is that correct? That's right. And he was quite brilliant because he was so good at math. He was able to figure the complex calculus of the ballistics to maximize the killing. He was a, um, a chess whiz when I was a kid. And I'm actually thinking of doing an epic poem about me and Steve called the uh, L.A. Book of the Dead. What do you think, Navi? Well, I think of the L.A. Book of the Dead about you and Steve would be interesting because what comes to mind when you mention that, of course, I'm at a distance from it because I read it on the news. I have no idea who Steve was. All I know is what I saw on the, on the screens. And yet, when I think about... Steve and personalize him as a friend of yours and definitely a horrible act that he finally found himself performing. My thought went to him as the individual holding all of the guilt of his act and yet the culture that drove him to that final moment when he did such a horrible thing that culture you came from beside the, the auto plant and the fighter jet plant and the oil refineries and how sad it is that someone who had all of that genius ended up in such a, a horrible, horrible moment for so many people, hundreds and hundreds of people. How will you work with that poetically? Because that's a challenging proposition to dance with. Here's how I dealt with it. As soon as Steve slaughtered all these people, and, and by the way, I'm not sympathetic. You know, I mean, I'm glad he killed himself. He should have done it before he killed the others. Um, it's just that cold. We went to a place called Poly High. It was also the city's dump. 
where they dumped mostly Chicanos, but also Steve's dad was a bank robber, escaped from prison. So after a while, he couldn't see his dad. Single mom, a tough time in the in the 50s and 60s to be a single mom. And again, living under the, the stacks of the coal plant on San Fernando Road. The school was supposed to be one of these new advances in education because they knew that kids like me and Steve were never going to go to college. And so the best thing, they would teach us a skill. So we were required to take drafting and electric shop and wood shop and metal shop. Those are required subjects. We didn't have advanced placement French. We didn't have calculus we didn't have any of those things he learned that stuff all on his own but, uh, we were supposed to go to vietnam and then come back and work at lockheed which he did as a draftsman an engineer because he was so bright and he should have been at stanford he should have been at yale with his math genius but instead he went to san fernando college got his job and then of course lockheed was shut down as was the the gm plant which was sent to mexico after nafta and i just did a film with shailene woodley where i had her go out to my old house it's a film called the best democracy money can buy you can download it for free at gregpalace.com shailene woodley and i go back to my old spot she's like a spirit that takes me back but there you see all the guys who had worked at the gm plant and they had their campers because they used to have paid month-long vacations after 20 years and now they're living in their campers along the tracks. You can't say they're homeless if you call that a home. That's what happened. And I escaped. I escaped. I literally talked my way into top schools. But Steve fell down the hole that was dug for him. He didn't get out. Everyone's saying, why did he do this? Why did he do this? Why did he do this? I said, I know why he did this. I knew Steve and I know why he did it. And why he did it. Sun Valley Pacoima is like North Hollywood. Your face is pressed against the glass watching other people eat a steak while they're feeding you dog food. And you get angry. You get real angry, as I did. But our mind turned into funny poems and crazy investigations and televisions and film. I just worked it and got out. And what I wrote was that there was just an inch of difference that could have led me down Steve's path. And I had a damn editor refuse to publish my story because he said no one would ever believe that an internationally famous investigative reporter was going to end up on a hotel room window murdering 56 people. It's just that little bit of difference. It's that little bit of luck that got me out. Hunter Thompson's phrase, I fell down an elevator shaft and landed on a pile of mermaids. Uh, Steve didn't. And I have to write about it. And I've been writing about it. And I, I think that everything I've ever done is writing about it. In fact, I end my book, Vulture's Picnic, with saying, what happened to these people? And ironically, I say, maybe they ended up in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's real close. And that's what motivates me. You were able to get out. Steve wasn't. What was it that got you out or what was it that moved you in the direction of getting away from the kind of fate that Steve suffered so horribly? Was it a moment in time? Was it some kind of awareness? I could give you some fancy explain. Oh, you know, I discovered poetry and I had to become an intellectual. I was reading books. I mean, it's true. I was 11 years old reading Paradise Lost. And I found this writer in a Hollywood bookstore for 10 cents, this cool looking book. And it was a portrait of the artist as a young man. And so I thought I had discovered James Joyce and read Ulysses. Uh, and so I was, you know, an intellectual, but so was Steve. I'm going to tell you what happened, actually. It's, it's, it's an interesting story, and it says the whole damn thing. I was lucky, okay? Number one, I'm a Jewish kid, which is unusual for my area, which means that I can see that there's another world possible. So I actually could understand that, believe it or not, what people you saw on TV living better lives, I could be one of those. I knew that it was possible. I just had to figure out where the key was hidden, but I knew that there was a way out, okay? In fact, my great uncle was on the U.S. Supreme Court and my other uncle was the head of the Writers Guild here in Hollywood. So while Steve is pressing his face against the glass, I'm feeling for the knobs to get out, okay? So I had a friend who was at Fairfax High, which is like Beverly Hills High, and they had a program. You took the battery of tests and you, they would let you into UCLA early, but they didn't even tell us kids in Loserville under the coal plant stacks that you could do this. I happened to be meeting my friend at UCLA. We we're going to go to the library. He says, well, I got to take these tests because I can get into the school. 
And so I walked in, I said, can I take the test? Is this restricted? This was the 60s. So everything was like loosey goosey. Said, no, take the test. So it's only by those connections that others don't have and the knowledge that it's there. And so I took the test. And by the way, I flunked one of the four tests. So it was called the subject A exam. Now you have to understand, you can't get into the University of California unless you pass this exam that says you know basic English, that you can spell and have grammar. And I flunked. I flunked it. But the dean of students at UCLA called up my principal and said, what the hell are you teaching kids in school? Tested his IQ. It's through the roof. We gave him the SAT without any practice. Perfect. It says, but then he's illiterate. <laughs> And they, he said, don't you teach the English language? And my principal said, we're lucky if someone can understand English at all at this school. And so they said, well, we'll take a chance on this kid. I ended up named head of the Philosophical Society at Trinity College, position previously held by Jonathan Swift and Oscar Wilde. That's a kid who flunked basic English. Someone gave me a chance today as they close off the exit. So that's what I always write about, about people whose exits have been not only cut off, but something else. They can't speak for themselves. And I really believe I've been put here on this earth to speak for those who can't speak for themselves, for the kids like Steve buried alive. And that's all over the world. And that's a pretty strong statement for an atheist <laughs> about why I'm here. But I kind of have to acknowledge that. I was just thinking, like, for example, I was in the Amazon, way up the Amazon River, where uh, Chevron oils had just poisoned the Amazon. And I found a chief. And I go meet this chief. He speaks Spanish, and most of the natives don't. But the chief spoke Spanish so we could communicate. And he said, you know, my son, my three-year-old son went swimming in one of the watering holes here, which was shiny, and didn't realize that the shine meant that there was oil in that water, oil dumped by Chevron oil waste. He came up coughing blood and dropped dead in his father's arms, and his other son died of leukemia. So I went with him to the jungle courtroom in Ecuador, in the middle of nowhere. He put on war paint, feathers, naked from the waist up. He was ready for battle and filed and had some people type up for him a lawsuit against Chevron for his son's death and for destroying the area. You know, they're laughing at this Indian dressed up like it's Halloween. Anyway, he won the suit, nine and a half billion dollar judgment. And because he had a guy, Steve Donziger, a lawyer in New York, who had graduated from Harvard with Obama, but instead of going out to cash in and make money, he decided to volunteer to work for these natives on their case. And he spent his life doing it. Right now, he's under house arrest in New York. Chevron found the judge to say that he had manipulated the case in Ecuador. This is completely insane. Well, he had refused to hand over to Chevron his computer and his cell phone because they'll find the names of whistleblowers. And in places like Ecuador and in South America, if you're on a list of whistleblowers, you're dead. The death squads will get you. He wasn't going to put these people in danger. So now he's facing six months in prison. Steve Donziger, go to my website, gregpalace.com, and get that story. So I'm speaking for Steve, but I'm more I'm speaking for Chief Criollo because he's there deep in the jungle. Now, I was able to get his story on the top of the BBC Nightly News. By the way, silenced here in America. No one would touch it. PBS NewsHour turned it down. And I said, well, wait a minute. It says that the main sponsor of the PBS NewsHour is Chevron Oil. Does that have something to do with not running this story? Again, I'm an atheist, so I don't know how this happened, but I was in a doctor's office and some guy, working class looking guy, brushed against me and I thought, did he just pick my pocket and take my wallet? And I reach in to my pocket to say, the, my wallet, there's a piece of paper. And it said on the piece of paper, thank you for speaking for those of us who can't. So that's what I do. And I'm trying to do it with the poetry too, which is not, by the way, generally overtly political. It's what did Pound say? It's the news for which men die every day? Well, it's interesting, the fellow that slipped a note in your back pocket could have been an angel. And I mean that in all serious, on all serious levels. If you think about the whole wide expanse of the universe being available to us as one proposition, then the idea of God becomes much more understandable. 
I was thinking when you're saying talk about angels, I was thinking two things. One, I just pulled up an angel poem, but I was also thinking, which is kind of somewhat inspired by Rilke's line, a yater angel is schrecklich, which is every angel is terrifying. In Lorca's essay uh, on the theory and the play of the Duende, he talks about the angels and he, he says the angels fly overhead and they sometimes bless you and they're at a bit of a distance, an angelic distance. The muses will get into your heart and sometimes are the muses. They will drive you crazy and, and they don't cooperate with you. But the Duende, the Duende deep in your body that bubbles bubbles below your belly button that sounds like the river's roaring and itches the skin. That's where the art is. So I love the idea of the angels being at a distance, but the Duende, that ooze that comes out of us as poets. I, I like the idea of the Duende. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll do a little uh, versification. So Greg Palace will now read a poem about angels, I think. I don't know if you remember this. For a while, there was a craze of finding your angel. And people used to go to these angel classes. You'd go into these classes and you'd find your angel and you start out, but you say, I'm breathing in light and I'm breathing out doubt. And your angel's supposed to appear to you. So I said, you know, okay, I'll take all the help I can get. Cross-legged, I got my hands up. I'm breathing in light and I'm breathing out doubt. This poem is a kind of Benadryl for your ooze. I'm breathing in light and I'm breathing out doubt. I'm breathing in light and I'm breathing out doubt. And finally, my angel whispers in my ear, jerk, she says, jerk. I'm breathing in light, I say very loud, and I'm breathing out doubt, hoping someone will hear and I'll get a more encouraging angel. Jerk, she says. I'm immortal, she says. And jerk, she adds. I'm just gorgeous. I don't care. And I can't see you. And I don't care. I know I'm a jerk. I don't need a divine proclamation. Go away. What I don't know has filled several books of unpublished poetry. What I don't know, I'm talking. You should be breathing in light and breathing out doubt. I'm such a total failure. Even my guardian angel is a disaster. Don't they have to test angels for personality or bedside manner? Or I'm into enlightenment. I don't care about all your problems like those cheap movie angels who stop you from killing yourself on Christmas. Go ahead, kill yourself on Christmas. I think it would do you some good. My legs have fallen asleep under me and I can't get off the prayer rug. I tell myself I'm through with gimmicks. My soul will have to take care of itself. Get out of here, I shout. I didn't send for you. I asked for the devil. I want to sell my soul for a major publisher with a high-powered marketing plan. Then, whomp, she hits me hard on the kisser. I fall back on the prayer mat. Angels don't hit people. That's got to be a rule. Jerk, she says. Jerk, 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 she shouts. And it is a thousand voices in tears and anger. And before I can get off the floor and run the gossamer, feathers of light surround me, choke me, smother me, blind me, cut me and fill me with a storm of blackened verses, useless, unspeakable poems without endings, without explanations, without any way to form or shout for help or say their name. So that's my bad luck with angels. That is bad luck with angels. So read <laughs> another one for us. This is not about my bad luck with angels. This is actually called Audition for Harvey Weinstein. Because I'm here in Hollywood, by the way. I made it up the hill from the pit of Sun Valley, Pacoima. So now I can actually see where I grew up from here. People listening might not know if they don't live in L.A. what made it up the hill means. I think I know what it means. It's, it's it, physical. As I was doing a, a film with Rosario Dawson and we were talking about it. And I said, Pacoima, Sun Valley is this trough. It literally is a trough. It's the most polluted place in California. It has the highest COVID rate in the nation. And But if you crawl out of that hill, financially, emotionally, artistically, now I'm up at the top of the hill in the Hollywood Hills, looking down above the smog. 
as I told Rosario, where I grew up from where I am now, I said, from where we're standing, I said, it is a 20 minute drive and 3000 miles. And that's what people don't understand when they watch a guy like Steve Paddock. By the way, my high school, we've had only uh, two mass killers born in Los Angeles, both graduated from my high school. It's not by accident, including the Santa Claus killer, the guy who dressed up like Santa Claus and killed himself and eight of his in-laws on Christmas Eve. Another way to get out of the trough, uh, a guy who in my school was expelled because he had ripped off a guy's face with his teeth. He was expelled, then he went to prison and he came out and a casting agent saw him and grabbed him. His name is Danny Trejo, who then went on to make the machete films and stop biting people's face off, except on camera. And it's when it's fake. That's where I come from. But the other way to get out is like Danny did is an audition. Uh, by the way, Sun Valley, where I came, was the porn capital of the world. And my girlfriend went to audition, not for porn film. Well, she thought not for the porn film. She went for an audition. So when Weiss was arrested, I went back to what she told me happened at her audition. And so the first part of it is nonfiction. So this is audition for Harvey Weinstein. So stick with me on this. If you were on a desert island after a plane crash, you would do all of these horrible things. You would eat dead bodies. Now, why are we listening to this freak? Because he is an employer and we are underemployed. Yes, you would. We will reveal it all. The whole dark hell of the human soul. We have the guts to film it. And we want to know if you have the guts to play it. What he wants to know is, are we willing to play girl corpses sticking out of the sand? The other three girls are from Iowa. They played Sandy in the Lansing High School production of Grease. They have glossies, and they are listening to this brain-damaged tarantula, and I am listening to this brain-damaged tarantula. But I am 8,000 years old. Yes, I am. So when we step out into the California storm, and hear him screaming back in his production office. My little sisters don't know that I have psychokinetically twisted his eyes back into his head. And as his sockets drip blood and mascara, he is looking straight into his own brain and he can't stop screaming. That's the kind of thing you can do when you're 8,000 years old. When you're 8,000 years old, you can do all these things. But you can't get a job, can you? Unless you put your lips around the tarantula. I'll tell you what. I'll trade you your resume. Your resume for this information. One, kill Mrs. Schneider because she lied to you in the third grade. Two, kill Santa Claus because he lies to children every day. Richard Nixon told you the truth when he said, evil is a full-time job. That's what he told me when I was much younger than you. That captures all this, the stuff that's going on for sure. Harvey Weinstein didn't invent the casting couch. Obviously, there's more. So in terms of the poetry you are writing, this piece that you just read, it's performative, it's almost like a monologue it's constructed so that it takes us into the grit of life and much of the work you do from underneath the smokestacks there's a grit about it do you ever find any inclination to write in the direction of something that's softer or is that something you've ever thought about doing and that's the other wonderful thing about poetry Unlike the deadlines I have, you know, and I listen to some editor at Rolling Stone say, well, that's not our style. They don't like the topic I'm trying to sell them or something. But instead, I have plenty of room. So um, let's see. I think uh, I find something here. Uh, yeah, this is something I just did. Looks a little bit different. So what did I throw up tonight? I'd say about a half pound of chicken jalfrezi from the Indian diner, two pounds of regret, 140 pounds of uh, envy. An old man shouts in his sleep, 
Millions used to listen to him or at least felt the discomfort in their dreams disturbed by the shouting. Now, his young wife is listening to a podcast with those earphones in, but the cat pays attention. The next act is flexing his muscles in the green room, younger, with that wonderful arrogance of self-delusion. And now a guest who needs no introduction. No, I would like to be introduced. Our next guest is the man that doesn't love his children. We have a caller on line two with a question for Greg Pallast. It's a uh, Mr. God who wants to know with all the evils, Mr. Pallast, what's your solution? What can we do about it? You know, it's an answer I've given many times, polished by expensive PR consultants. But I can't remember any of the lines I've practiced. I realize there's nothing we can do about it. And the man, not the man who forgot his gloves on the bus, not the man on the line who created the heavens and the earth, not my young bride, nor my cat, nor yours. The line goes dead. The silence suffocates. And a tiny planet fights for the words, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Nice. It's more work to read than to write. It's an interesting thing to think about because when we write our poetry and we generate our work, it's one thing. But then when, when you enter it from the storytelling spoken word point of view, if you will, uh, engaging with it, especially given the story you've already told us about how you did fight to get out. So I think that we have an instinct to go do something that makes our lives happier, that makes our lives more abundant, more productive, more generous, and, and more able to care about the people that are around us. I think we all have that drive. And sometimes it gets turned in the direction Steve, Steve got turned in. Somehow poetry allows us all to stay in that sensibility. And even though you are driven to speak for all those who can't speak, it's interesting that you are still speaking for the Greg Palast who couldn't speak as well. So you are everybody in a sense. I can hear that struggle in your well, performance I, I feel, voice. Well, I'll tell you that I do feel smothered a lot, even now. But it's a different ghetto that I've been put in. I crawled out of Sun Valley, Pacoima, uh, the smog hole. I'm still ghettoized as a journalist. And this has affected me. In other words, I can tell these stories third of a million voters have been challenged in Georgia. I can't get that on the air in the U.S. for love or money. When I went to the jungle, to the rainforest, and met with the indigenous people that were being literally poisoned, murdered, killed by chevrons, top of the BBC Nightly News, which is great, it went all over the world except my own country, where it bounced off the electronic Berlin Wall. So I feel my words get smothered, you know, I mean, compared to others. Yeah. You could say I'm lucky. I've had a bunch of bestsellers. I'm in some big outlets and once in a while they let me on MSDNC or whatever, but, uh, and they used to, but not anymore allow me on national petroleum radio. If I could have found Steve, I'd said, well, you know what? I could use your brains. The words are going to strike them harder than your bullets. But I still feel smothered. And so that frustration comes out in that poem I just read to you. It's our world which can't speak the truth, but it's also obviously very personal to me. Again, the poetry is uncensored by an editor, uncensored by a television executive. It's the full thing. It's an area in which I can actually operate uncensored, which I love. My book, Vulture's Picnic, which is somewhat autobiographical. And by the way, there's a lot of poetry in there. What I did is I took out the enjambment. I sneak it in. You don't actually know that there's several poems in there. I wanted to start the book with two words. The second word is God, but the first word is a, a word we can't use on community radio, as you say. Mm-hmm. Penguin said they're not going to publish it unless I take out those words. I actually got several ministers to write them. <laughs> Believe it or not, a rabbi, a minister, a psychologist, a professor, all saying that what Greg has written is actually a very religious book. And you can't get to the heart of things unless you doubt this system. So yeah, so I still get censored even in my books. And you know, in poetry, 
unlike a lot of the of the art forms, poetry has never been commercialized at the level the other art forms have been. So it, there's it's a bit more open in terms of allowance. What I think happens is that the censorship that you feel around your journalistic work is indeed in place in the world for sure. And, and it is with poetry. So for example, you can't say certain words on a community radio station. You can say almost anything you want to on a podcast. So in a sense, in this poetic arena, censorship forces us as poets to craft the message so that it gets through the filters. Unlike a lot of messages that can get stopped, it's possible to put the poetry through those filters. And there's so many different ways of getting it out. And there's some kind of magic about poetry that allows it to be heard under almost any circumstances. I only knew two poets who trained me how to write. One was uh, Allen Ginsberg, the other was my mailman, Charles Bukowski. You know, Ginsburg became internationally famous. He's one of the only poets who's ever been on the cover of Time magazine. He was 29 years old. Here he's on the cover of Time magazine because, because he was arrested for obscenity for his poem, Howl, put out by City Lights Books, because he'd used the word mother lover in the poem. Williams, his, I told you, William Carlos Williams was his pediatrician and mentor. He said, would you take that word out? And Ginsburg actually presciently said, I'm leaving it in because you know what? Maybe I'll get arrested and that will bring some attention to it. And boy, did it worldwide. The reason Allen Ginsberg became the most successful, that is the most read, and certainly most financially successful poet of our time, the last century, was that because of scandal. Same with Ulysses. We wouldn't have known about that wonderful book if it hadn't been banned. Or, In fact, there's a lot of terrible artists who become famous because they've been banned from scandal and they don't deserve it. But so scandal can be very helpful. It's only when we say something naughty or do something naughty that uh, poetry gets any notice. Naughty also can be interpreted as pushing the limits and using language that you can't use on community radio. All of that language, when used artistically, has great power. So none of it is really vulgar when it's placed properly. And all of it can be just horrible and terrible and off tone if it's placed in the wrong way. How do you figure out how to use all of this language and build your own coding into it so that it rings in someone else's psychology, in someone else's imagination and affects them? So why don't you close us out with one more poem, Mr. Pallast? This is called Cruel and Silent on the Phone. Larry, please. I don't believe in God. I, I believe in you and the kids. I don't want to die. Did, did, did Liddy call? Why can't she pick up the phone and call? Don't argue about the tests. I don't need tests. And that's when his head popped off and floated over the hospital air conditioners and the hospital parking lot like a grinning balloon. He was 200 years old again. This can't be the last time. I'm scared. I'm scared of Bernstein, that schmuck. And, and Liddy doesn't back me up. Why isn't she on my side? What the hell was he doing in a client's rental car in Utah? He was just too old for this crap. He knew one thing. He'd come to build his mother's tomb. Larry stood over the bed, holding a, a sword over her head. She was only two minutes old now, tiny and red in the hospital gown meant for a, a grown woman, a grown and old dying woman. Everyone, said Lydia, 11,000 miles away, everyone, said Lydia to the bottle, gets one last phone call. What's the last bill I'll pay before I die? What'll be my very last car? A Cadillac, that's what. A monster mother Mercedes, that's what, mister. Every day, in every way, I'm getting a wee bit better. Every day, in every way, I'm getting a wee bit better. Newborn and fresh, impotent and insomniac, he learned the lessons of Vietnam and was ready to make a buck. The sword came down. Larry's bride cradled the severed, bleeding phone cord in her arms and sang a lullaby. 
we're all scared of Bernstein. I only wish on you a daughter who treats you like you treat me. And just as she said it, a daughter just like her was born out of her ear, born to be cruel and silent on the phone. Greg, it's been such a pleasure to have you come back and be here a second time. I really, really do appreciate it. And it's always fun to check in and see what the political climate's like out there in the field and to see what the uh, poetic climate is like inside your head. So thanks so much for being on Twice Five Miles Radio. I really do appreciate it. It's a thrill. It's a challenge. And it's dangerous. And I love it. <laughs> All right. And there you go, my friends, a conversation with Greg Pallast on the Imaginative Storm podcast channel. I'm glad you tuned in. My name is James Nave. I'm your host, and I do hope you tune in to other offerings we have. And please do consider joining us on Saturday morning for our Imaginative Storm Writing Prompt of the Week session, which I host with my creative collaborator, Allegra Houston. 10 a.m. Mountain Time, noon Eastern Time. It lasts an hour. We gather with 20, 25 writers on a Zoom call, and and then we read our work and discuss it a little bit. We have fun, and we would love to have you on the call. So join us, and you can find out all about it at imaginativestorm.com, imaginativestorm.com. And if you would like to ask me a question about it, nave at jamesnave.com. I'll be happy to answer your your questions by email. I can even set up a phone call with you if you would like. Uh, Nave is spelled N-A-V-E. So for now, signing off from the imaginative storm, and I'll catch you next time on that turnaround somewhere down the line.